drawing the evoked dreams of the palaces and minarets of the Far East. And softly through the silence ring the bells along the golden road to Samarkand. This is not Samarkand. The magic of the distant places that haunted the mind of the child who made that drawing will not be found here. And yet in this part of Cardiff, the Butte Town area of Cardiff's Dockland, there are many whose origins lie in places like Samarkand, Bombay, Hong Kong, Luanda. Ships take people out and they bring people in. Once these multiracial streets throbbed with life and money, millionaires and their oak paneled exchanges sprouted like berries. Violent tensions produced by poverty, drink and intolerance gave the place its name, Tiger Bay. But the noise and the passion are gone. The mountains of coal that once went out via the bunkers of these docks to every port of the world have now dwindled to molehills. An air of threadbare quietness hangs over the place. In a corner quarrel or an overheated bar, an odd flame may shoot out. But in the main, the place is tranquil, tame, and timid. In the great exchanges, temples of Victorian optimism, where once fortunes hang on the excited shouts of brokers, and where India and Africa were regarded as suburbs of Loudoun Square and Cathedral Road, Cardiff, they are now for the most of their days as quiet as the grave. The great dynasties of Welsh coal owners and shipping magnates are as dead as Babylon, gathering dust and death duties. Mount Stewart Square sees more people setting forth for a day trip to Western Supermare than it sees of mariners bound for the imperial conquest of the world's five oceans. And the people who came here from India, China, Africa have remained to form this strange corner of Wales. Only now and then is one reminded of the many lands and races that went to make up this community. The Welsh accent is tinged with the native inflections of languages like Swahili, Hindi, Somali, Madras shakes hands with Merthyr, and Pune nods at Pentrebach. <laughs> Children grow up with hardly a memory of the reputation this place once had. The apartness once felt for their parents and grandparents, alien in their faith and race. Whenever any two children of different races play together, humanity grows an inch or two. Another ancient fear, another mouldering prejudice is told to mend its manners and behave. A child expects to have and enjoy a wider, brighter world than its parents knew. Types of squalor and stupidity that are expected and tolerated in one generation are regarded as foolish and dangerous in another. So it is in New Town. The children grow up into a new sort of unity. The older and more aggressive dwellings come down one by one. Playing spaces let a brighter light into life. Clean air and bathrooms lend the beginnings of a smiling grace to a place that has known little of it. The names of shops and cafes can still suggest the exotic, the different. The Kui Noor, the Taj Mahal, the Pearl of the East, clubs with names like the Caribbean, the Latvian, the Norwegian, suggest small last-ditch groups striving to preserve unity against the advance of assimilation. Shops cater for peculiarities of diet that are found in various religions and sects. You've heard of chicken in the mitt. This is chicken in the window. You can study it, buy it, and take it home alive before the feathering and frying start. That way, it's much more of an adventure. There are few places in Britain that have been compelled to make more and faster changes in their economic ways. 
To the north of here, hundreds of collieries that once sent millions of truckloads rumbling south to make Cardiff a fast-growing Klondike of a town. Now produce nothing but silence and angry letters from people who want to remove the ruins and forget the past. Even when a dock is booming, there is something a little mysterious and forbidding about it. And when it's past its peak of prosperity, there is something even more forbidding and mysterious about it. It's like an eye which once looked far out onto the world and from which the light has now dimmed. Mount Stewart Dock. Who would ever have thought that those words could ever sound less noble, less impressive than they did 50 years ago? The sea must laugh a little at some of the changes it sees around its shores. It can afford to. Being a wave is unskilled labor and permanent. To a part of the world renowned for its theological zeal and its number of different congregations, the immigrants have brought their own variations on the theme of reverence. Some of the churches fit snugly enough into the pattern of our own observances. Others have a color, a strangeness, a complexity of ritual that can be startling for an eye raised on the gray simplicities of the Welsh chapel. In some, to the accompaniment of softly beaten drums and mournful chanting, the sacred books of India are revered and read. In the mosques, the Muslims thank Allah for having done for the Arab world what Owen Glyndwr and Lloyd George failed to do for the Welsh, which is give them unity of faith. city changes and nowhere will the change be more dramatic than it will be here. In the post-war years when ideas of replanning hit this part of the world with gale force, some radical and ambitious notions were voiced about the future of this area. A surprising number of people viewed Butetown with such loathing that they had no patience with a slow piecemeal remodeling of the place. Do it that way, they said, and you'd still find yourself tripping over the tendrils of the past. So destroy it, root and crop. Efface the last memory of it and transfer the Butown community to a part of Cardiff in fresh green surroundings where the past could be sheared away. The municipal vet would put pay to the tiger once and for all. That idea came to nothing and just as well. This place has a flavor, a sound which are worth keeping. Reshaping a community should be done gently as taking an arm out of a splint. This little world in miniature belongs near the sea, near the sight and sound of the ships whose comings and goings brought them together in the first place. Gradually, the last unworthy dwellings, the last dingy cat-infested alleys, the long, ugly, massively built walls of the pre-1914 industrialists will be flattened. But something distinctive, some of the vitality and warmth of people, less inhibited, less cautious than we, will remain. And what will remain to fascinate those people in the future who will brood on the story and personality of this place? It will be the irony of it all. The irony, the furious flashing contrasts of the scene, made all the more remarkable by the brevity of the experience. The twitches of world trade brought the bay into existence. The eclipse of coal brought its fortunes tumbling. Tolerance took out the sting of strangeness and an almost total integration gave a special piquancy to the massive task of reconstruction, which we see now. The whole thing has happened before the eyes of just two generations. Furious, flashing contrast. 
costs. First, the people themselves, the folk of the bay, fenced in, limited, even mutilated by every disadvantage that humans have ever devised for each other, prejudice, poverty, and all their ugly sisters. Then, arising from them as the mushroom cloud rises from the obscenity of our monster bombs, that incredible explosion of wealth, when the Marquises of Butte married the minerals of their vast domains to the industrial genius of thrusting young Welsh village boys like Lord Davis of Llandinam and made it anew. They were the real tigers of Tiger Bay, and nearly all their cages are empty.